This has got to be our life. We've got to be in love with this. This is our emotion. And here's 10 names. But the one I want is this one. It's not a binary of if I feel good, I do poorly. Or if I do well, I feel terrible. There is a mm-hmm. way in which you can be high functioning, high productivity, and also not feel terrible all the time. The CEO happened to write a book and said our most important asset is our employees. And in three years, he never mentioned, even mentioned them. The scarcest commodity to me is not time, it's positive emotional energy. And you have to have lows to have higher and higher positive emotional energy that's real. What does your image say about you? Because when somebody knows that Patty Ann's coming to a meeting, they're either elated or they're pissed off. Which one is it going to be for you? I see it as, you know, one company at a time, one organization, one team at a time. When they live more meaningfully with alignment, with purpose and values, that in effect is how we're creating positive change in society and how we interact with ourselves and each other. By the time we got together, we we really had... uh, the, the Reebok company had started to grow. Mm-hmm. But, of course, uh, we had started up as Mercury, and our first challenge was came. Our accountant, because we were doing nicely, our accountant said, uh, Joe, you better register your name. And we were a bit sort of naive, young, didn't understand why we needed to register our name. But he did the name tell Mercury, The name Mercury uh, Foot. Mercury, yes, you needed to register Mercury. And of course, we uh, <clears throat> we said, that, "Why, why, why do I need to do that?" And he told us, "Well, if other people like you, they, they think that the Mercury uh, shoes are looking pretty good, and they start making Mercury, you're going to have a problem as to who owns the name." So we tried. Well, I said, well, "Okay, how do how do I do that?" And he said, "Well, you go and see a patent agent." And he gave me a name of somebody uh, in Manchester, which was local to us. Uh, he said. This, they will do the registering of the name. However, on... Uh, Is that with the trademark attorney? You'd probably call it trademark attorney, yeah. and we'd call them patent agent. They did okay. the same thing. Right, yeah. right. And uh, so we went, I went along to see him and told him what we wanted. He said, okay, we'll do that. It took him about seven days or so because he searched the register and came up with uh, the fact that it was already registered. Mercury was pre-registered by uh, British Shoe Corporation. Now, British Shoe Corporation were massive. They were a big corporation. And uh, he, he'd already sort of checked things out with them. And he said to me, he said, well, they've got it registered, but they're not using it. Oh. He said, so you can buy it off them for a thousand pounds. Well, we just set up a whole company for 250 pounds, machinery, everything, mm-hmm. the whole thing for 250. And uh, I said, just we just haven't got that sort of money. We just have not got a thousand pounds. And the bank, we're too young. The bank will not lend that sort of money without mm-hmm. collateral, and we don't have collateral. So, well, he said, if you can't buy it, he said, you could, you could take them to court because they're not using it. You could take them to court and you could claim it. Okay. How much would that cost us? And he said, about a thousand pounds. Catch 22. Which way do you go? <clears throat> so, okay. And he said, if you can't do that, you just got to find me another name, which was a bit sort of destroying. We were 18 months how many, down the road. Yeah. How many years? Eight. And Mercury was that? That was what was, how did you come up with that name? That was a god, right? Yes. A well, running Mercury, god or something? Mercury is the winged messenger. The wing, there you go. Okay. The winged yeah. messenger. He has the wing, wings on his heels. And on the he, heels, right. He holds a torch. <clears throat> so it was very relevant. Yeah. We're a running company. This right. is, sounds pretty good, that. You know, Mercury. Very why not? And, uh, and Mercury, the winged messenger, was our logo. So, yeah, we were happy with that. <sighs> and so... I mean, I went back to the to the office and we're sitting down, pretty well destroyed. But uh, the paint agent said, don't bring me one name. Bring me ten. Again, ten names. And I'm saying to him, how do we do that? Anyway, we sit down and we're around the table. And uh, I'm thinking, Cougar. We, bring, we come up with Cougar. Cougar sports. That's a, that sounds pretty good. We're not Cougar. Okay, and we, we came up with a lot more names, either animals or or birds, 
Um, and we had all this list. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take you back now to 1943. We're, we're now sitting in 1960, but let me take you back to 1943. 1943, I was eight years old. And this was right in the middle of World War II. Yep. And a bit like COVID, people couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the holidays at the seaside, no, they were out. You couldn't get petrol. So it was, and, and they, uh, they had these stay at home uh, <clears throat> athletic meetings. And my father, he he had uh, he had entered me into a I think I had an eighty yards race, an eighty yard sprint, <clears throat> and it was a handicap race. So I had a bit of a bit of a lead on this, but only being eight, I think under ten or whatever it was. <clears throat> but I also had, had the biggest advantage I had. I was wearing Foster Spike running shoes, and <clears throat> if you can imagine, during the war, who else would be wearing Spike running shoes? Right. Nobody. <clears throat> so, so that was my secret weapon, and I won the race. Hey, right. I won the race, and I went up for my prize. <clears throat> my prize. Yes, what was my prize? My prize was a dictionary. And I'm somewhat protesting. I said, where's the football? You know, what can I do with the dictionary? Where's the football? And, uh, and also, the fact is, it was uh, it was American dictionary. So the spellings in there would be more useless for you at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the spelling, you know, I I think the in America don't use the letter U. You know, you, color is C O L O R. In in the UK, color is C O L O U R. And right. same with labor and a lot of the, so a lot of the spellings are different. And uh, okay. At the time, I probably used it as a football. I probably was so disgusted at the fact that we'd given, given the dictionary. But now we come back to 1960, and here's my dictionary sat by, the, by my side. And I like the letter R. You know, for whatever reason, you know, R was seemed a strong letter to me. So I pick a up strong my Strong letter. That's interesting. I've never heard anybody think of a letter as strong. <laughs> but there you go. It's the first. Yeah. I, there you go. I, yeah. I, I felt it was the letter. So I opened up my dictionary <clears throat> at the letter R. And I start leafing through, going through. <clears throat> and it's not long before I come across R W -E B O K. And I think Reebok. Oh, what's that? What's Reebok? And it's a small South African gazelle. Wow. We're a running company, a gazelle. That's it. Reebok. Top of the list. So we then had a list of 10, but Reebok is at the top. And I, I went back to the patent agent and I said, look, this has got to be, this has got to be our life. We've got to be in love with this. Mm -hmm. you know, this is our emotion. And here's 10 names. But the one I want is this one, Reebok. It's got to be Reebok. And he's a lawyer. Does he care? No. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> Two weeks later, he'd searched all these names out, and uh, he, he called me on the phone and said, Joe, he said, you've got your wish. He said, the only one that's really clear, there are a couple of things on it, but there's all that's really clear is Reebok. We, we have uh, two problems. No, phonetically, we have two problems. One is uh, uh, Rebo. Um, that's R-E-B-O-W, they said, but, mm -hmm. and they make ladies' underwear. And he said, but we don't think that they will even uh, even consider that Reebok is a problem. The other one is Railbrook. And Railbrook is um, a name uh, for a shirt, which uh, a, a local, quite a large company, Tootles, were making this shirt called Railbrook. And uh, <clears throat> he said, but I'm also their patent agent, so we won't complain. So that was it. Said there's just one caveat here that the register has raised, and he said uh, if you if somebody comes along and start making shoes out of Reebok skin, you can't stop them. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, well, Jeff and I we sat there and said, no, that's never going to happen. Nobody's going to do that. It's no, that's it. So okay, you can have your name, but because of that. 
the registrar said, well, we're going to put you in the B section of the register. B? The B section. Okay. Of the register. And I thought, it's a register. I didn't know there was an A section or a B section or whatever. But that puts, puts Reebok as uh, our name in the B section. Okay. We didn't believe anybody would make a show out of Reebok skin anyway, or anybody would be, would be allowed to make, to make a show out of Reebok skin. Right. And, that's what uh, I was thinking, yeah. That's right. However, 10 years later, the registrar came back to us and said, we've moved you from the B section to the A section. And we said, well, why is that? He said, well, everybody now knows Reebok as a sports shoe, not as an animal. So we, we moved into the A section of the register. And that's how it became Reebok. I was just out to dinner last night with friends, and we were talking about the mental health crisis in the country, uh, probably in the world. So, so give, talk about how this information, and somebody comes to you or somebody's listening and they're struggling with anxiety and depression, and maybe they appear to be functioning, but inside they're falling apart. So, how would you how would you help them? Mm, well, if they're coming through my door, that that's half the battle right there because a lot of people exactly a lot of people really operate under this assumption that doing well is end game doing well is the panacea once you're motivated everything is fine once you achieve your goals everything is fine but it's not enough to just do well we also want to be well and so if someone's coming through my door they've already reckoned with okay i'm doing great but i feel terrible and mm -hmm. so i'm i'm not big on trying to sell people on why they should do the work that we do um i'm more like come you know if you're sick and tired of feeling like everyone is patting you on the back for your accomplishments but you can't sleep and your relationship Relationships are a mess and you constantly feel like you're about to get in trouble or that the walls are caving in when you're ready to not feel like that there's my door come on in and let's talk mm -hmm. but I never set out to convince you know people again corporate people and I love corporate people they are wonderful but when they're like well why should I listen to you I'm like you shouldn't I'm like don't you don't have to if you're fine with what's going on then great, you know, I support you. But my hunch is you're not actually fine. You're doing mm -hmm. great, but you're feeling not fine. And there are ways to work with, and, you know, you don't have to, I, it's not a binary of if I feel good, I do poorly, or if I do well, I feel terrible. There is a mm -hmm. way in which you can be high functioning, high productivity, and also not feel terrible all the time. And mm -hmm. so I, I help people primarily with taking out these stories that do us absolutely no good and they're inaccurate. These stories of, well, if I, the story of, well, if I'm happy and calm, I won't be as motivated. That's an interesting one. The story of, well, I need anxiety because well, hang I don't. On. What's interesting? Tell us more about that. You said, what's interesting about that? Just how, where did that story come from? Like that belief is so firmly ingrained that if I'm happy, I will be lazy. That one I've seen and heard often enough that that's a belief that people have. If you're that, happy, you will be lazy yeah. as opposed to content? No, if I'm happy, I will be lazy as opposed to productive and motivated, i.e. Mm. I have all of these goals and all of these things I want to do. And if I'm just happy, I'm just going to be sitting around feeling happy and I won't get anything done. It's so interesting. I, you know, I, I haven't heard that before, although I did read that. It's actually on my notes here. Um, but you can be happy in one area of your life, but you can still be ambitious and wanting to learn in another area of your life. So where did that story come from? I have no idea. I mean... I have absolutely no idea, but I do know it is often the stories that we tell ourselves that create, you know, life can be hard and it's not mm -hmm. just like, oh, it's just your story. It's like, no, like global <laughs> pandemic and geopolitical unrest and aging parents and sick children. I mean, there are a lot of legitimate life stressors. However, often it's the stories that we attach to our situations that create unnecessary anxiety. Unnes there's, there's a certain amount of stress that we're all going to have as humans. Sure. But when we can dismantle these stories of not good enoughness or these myths about mental health, that if I admit I need help, that means there's something wrong with me or whatever mm -hmm. the story may be. But sussing out the story is usually task number one of feeling better. What's the story that you're telling yourself? So what are, are, do you see patterns 
in store in the stories over your over your practice over time? Oh, sure. Imposter sure, yeah. syndrome is a fun one. I hear yeah, that one mind. from every okay. single level, every single socioeconomic pl- like everyone has imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. You have it, I have it. Whoever's listening to this has it to a degree, not always. Um, but it's so nice to know that that is a universal experience because if we all have it then we don't have to worry about overcoming it. It's just knowing that's just a thing that we all have. So so you will, if this is a fair statement, you will normalize the thought, the unproductive thought? Normalizing, yes. And sometimes people will normalize something and then that just means like now they have to live with it. And that's not true for everything. Like you can normalize that life is hard, but that doesn't mean there's nothing that can be done. But with imposter syndrome, normalizing it makes it not just your thing. So if you're in a room full of very, very intelligent people, know, knowing that they all feel it does help to take some of the sting out of it. It's a lot easier to walk into a room if you know everyone has it. Well, it goes it, it goes back to how we started our conversation, knowing you're not alone, mm-hmm. even in the story. Right. I it is amazing because working with so many high functioning people, it is amazing that they're like, everybody else sees that I'm talented, everybody else, but how come I don't feel it? Mm-hmm. You know, that that type of story. Um so what 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 do you offer? Like I, I loved I read something about where you said remembering what happened without re-experiencing what happened. So talk about how you put that into play, helping somebody that, and there's all, trauma is on a spectrum, right? So I would imagine that the, your work, your techniques, it's the, the platform and the, the baseline, and then it's also within the spectrum. So it's probably not all that different for someone with severe trauma versus someone that has the trauma of, you know, even something so simple as, oh my gosh, I, you know, I was late for a really important meeting. There's a lot of anxiety attached to that. So what, what, what do you do? How do you help them? How do you help them help themselves? How do you help them? So there's the split of people who want to dive into the past and spend hours in analysis and figuring out the how and the who and the why. And so for that crew, we want to bring them out of the past and focus on what's happening here and now. But Mm -hmm. then you also have the crew that's like, whatever happened in the past is in the past. There's no point in going back there. And for that crew, it's, well, the past doesn't actually stay in the past. The past stays in your nervous system. So if you're constantly bumping up against the same stuff, then we may want to just look in the rear view mirror and there's a reason the rear view mirror is small and your windshield is large. You know, we Mm -hmm. don't want to stay in the past. And this isn't about another story I hear is I don't want to do this whole talking about childhood, blaming the parents thing. It's like, Mm -hmm. that's not necessary, but it does help if you have a pattern in the present to know that the past is in the present in the form of patterns and symptoms. Well, the past past informs your present, right? And what I tell people, you're only, anything in life, whether therapy, work, coach, anything, you only look backwards in the service of moving forward. Otherwise you get yourself stuck in the past and that doesn't help. Exactly. So we want to take the fear of the past or the fascination of the past and regulate it to like what you just said, the past is there to inform our work now so we can move forward. So for people who are way too past focused or way past avoidant, we want to be able to give the past a smaller size of the pie in terms of therapy. I don't spend a lot of time digging around in the past. It's just what happened and where, if that's available, sometimes that information is not available and that's Mm -hmm. okay. That's another beautiful thing about what we know now about the neuroscience. You don't need to remember your past to heal from past patterns. They might talk about caring about the people that work with them and for them, but they don't. Hey, come on, I, I, I listen. The, 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 the truth. Look, we have to be honest. We have to look in a mirror. You, you have to say it. No matter how arrogant or rude it may be, I, I was, for instance, on the board of one company and I, on, on several boards. We had a three-year retreat. We had after three years, we had a retreat. I was there three years when we had a retreat, and we had a big book with other various tabs. And the CEO said, "Let's look at the tabs. Is there anything else we should discuss?" So I looked at the tab and I said, yeah, we should be discussing something else. Two more things. We should discuss our customer, which we have never done in three years. Oh, Not, my. Once. Not once. 
And we should talk, talk about employee, which we have never done in three years that I'm here. Wow. Never in three years on the board did we talk about employees and customers. Yeah, well, you know, what, what do you expect? You know, and, but of course, well, wait, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. The CEO happened to write a book and said our most important asset is our employees. And in three years, he never mentioned, even mentioned them. Oh. And well, you know, so it, 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 it's a very sad situation because, but he is in the corner. He, he, he didn't learn in, 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 in business school that the real thing is having employees that want to do the job. You know, I mean, work can be so beautiful. <clears throat> and that's what this, this metode meant. It's a place of creating excellence for all concerned. It's a beautiful place. And so, and when I think of and where, <clears throat> what is I, any business, and people say B2B and so all these, these stupid statements, there's no such thing. <laughs> There's, <laughs> there's one business who deals with another business, yes, but there is a human being in one business deals with a human being in the other business. And it's all relation. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> so so this beautiful thing that I'm and now can uh, you select people to join me, employees, not to work for me, but we don't think about it. Well, what do we do? We hire employees. Why do we hire employees? To fulfill a function. Mm -hmm. Just like the chair in which you're sitting is fulfilling a function. But we're dealing with human beings. How about inviting them to join us? Well, that's why I like when people call somebody a member of their team because they have a different emotional investment than being an employee. And yet, clearly, the Ritz-Carlton and your imprint is People, you know, that's the expression. Maybe it's yours. If you take care of your employees, they will take care of your uh, you know, customers. You mentioned a word already here, team. Mm -hmm. They all talk about team. If you start working the first day, we said we're a team here. Now, what the heck is a team? Yeah. A team uh, yeah. has to be a group of people who have a common objective. What you mean? You mean in, in your company, the worker that is a, a, on a loading, work on a loading dock, does he have the same objective that the company has? Mm -hmm. Oh, he, he, because he doesn't even know the vision of the company. Right. So don't tell me that you're a team if not everybody is working for the same objective. A, team, I, a thousand percent agree. Yeah. Team works together for a common objective and helps it, uh, each other toward that objective. The reason to come to work is not the function of the day but is to accomplish that objective, which is good for all concerned. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds like such common sense. How did you operationalize that, right? Because common sense is the least common of senses. But you, any again, if anybody walks into the Ritz-Carlton, you know you are in a different place. I, I would like to say something about Ritz-Carlton. First of all, I left Ritz-Carlton many years ago. Many years ago, mm -hmm. I started, I worked, I was running the company for the first 20 years or so, close to 20 years. Then though I formed another company and which I sold a couple of years ago, which is now voted number one in the world. The consulting group? That's Capella. Capella, the consulting group, right. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, uh, Capella, which is now uh, 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 rated number one hotel company in the world, is there none in the US, only in Asia and Europe. So, so it 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 didn't only work in its the philosophy; it worked in other places too. Of course, and it is just a philosophy, the philosophy. And then, of course, you said it. You, it's not enough to have that thought and the philosophy. You have to create processes to accomplish your philosophy. Mm -hmm. It, 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 that is called management. You know, that I, I always make it very clear the difference between management and leadership is management creates systems, processes, or uh, uh, and measurements and controls to be sure what the customer wants is happening. Leadership creates an environment where the employees want to do what the customer expects, want to do, not have to do. Management makes sure the, the, the employees does it but leadership makes sure the employee wants to do it. Mm -hmm. that, that's, there's a huge difference. 
by making sure that everybody feels part of it. So, so we, the way we processed this, mind you, our Ritz Gardens and now Capella, anywhere in, in, in the case of Ritz Carlton, in five continents, each hotel was voted number one in their location. Wow. You know, so it didn't matter if it was in China or in Africa. It didn't matter. It's the process. It's, it's the processes we created to make sure it happened. And the process started with selecting, first of all, the right employees. But and how did all, you do that? How, how did you do that? Because that's huge. Yeah, that's huge. But we, frankly, used an outside company to help us. First of all, we went and determined the the uh, talent needed in each job category. The skills. So the talent meaning the skill set. The skill set for each job. job. Right. That's the first thing, right? First thing. And then we, we did determined the, the behavioral attitude around each job and so on. So, and then we determined, then with the outside company, determined how, with what questions it takes to determine if the employee has it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so we had a very careful process to selecting, not hiring people. But already in selection, we told the employees, don't join us. Don't no, don't work for us. Join, Join our us. Team. So can you give an example? Can you give an example of that? Because you 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 definitely you need to hire for skill and you're also hiring for character and integrity. So so give an example of somebody that works the front desk, right? There's a certain skill set that you need for that. Then what's the really the magical piece, I think, the piece that makes the difference, right? Plenty of people can check people in, right? Yeah. But the yeah. other piece, what, yeah. what was that? How did they had that? A, they, had a, they had two, basically there were two things in the, now we looked at the technical ability to work with computers and, and all that all that stuff. Sure. Mm-hmm. And that can be taught. That's but easy, then, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. We looked at uh, two things, a welcoming spirit and, and um, uh, what's, what, what do you call, what's the word? I'm sorry. And uh, empathy. Ah. Uh. And empathy, because when when guests had a need or a issue, they usually got it from this. Not even the concierge; they got it from this. Now the concierge also had to have empathy, but from this, for some reason, when people check in, check out, and all of a sudden <clears throat> they have somebody in front, they tell the well, I would have really liked that. that I'm looking, and and when they once they know that person, they come back and love in and go to that person. Gee, I'm. I don't really like to be on a high floor or whatever. Right. And there's no empathy for their situation. And then, of course, we, and because of that, we also, now, in addition to that, in case they had a problem, the guest, we certified each employee in the company, mind you, each employee for problem resolution. How mm-hmm. then, we, of course, in this, now, but you asked me about selection. So we may select that they have empathy. And then, of course, we taught them how to react with the empathy. To If they have an issue, where the guest has an issue, listen, what's the number one? Two, show empathy. Three, apologize if there's something wrong, no matter if it's you or not. Four, make amends. So we certified and taught them mm-hmm. around mm-hmm around what we selected. We didn't just say, okay, they have it. Now we'll leave it there. We mm-hmm. said, now how can we teach them to really use this properly? So mm-hmm. the selection was very, very precise. And I, I give it in my book, I give the example. And what does it take, for instance, what does it take to be a doorman? Clearly, they had to be pretty intense and they had to enjoy working outside. Mm-hmm. Hot, cold, no matter what. So we learned, this is kind of really, I, I, I had a real laugh and I found out about me. So finally we looked as we built this, okay, now that we have gone through this, we all like to ask them, what do you like? What do you like to do in your, in your life? Well, the outdoor people like to gardening, field, forest. And it turned out after we had hired a number of them, we said, let's look back how successful that is. And we looked at the, the five doormen were rated number one in the company. 
and we interviewed them very careful. What is common? What what and what do they have in common? <laughs> it's kind of funny. They all like gardening. At an early age, I don't know if you made the choice. I suspect you might have just done it. You made a choice to take your circumstances and you could have been a victim, but you decided to be a victor. Um, abs- absolutely. And, and if I was going to add to that, or I, I yes. should add to it, I um, I could trust that. So the, Wait, are we in your studio? We are in my music studio. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. My... Um, my thinking back then, the the home environment was wasn't just dysfunctional; it was toxic. There was a lot of really bad things that were going on. Um, and when I was out there in the world, trading my best efforts, you know, you know, mowing lawns, you know, shoveling snow, you know, et cetera, um, I could trust that I could I could create more value. I would get paid more. Um, I felt valued in what was going on, and I just kept building on that over time. And I think it saved me in such a big way from the the dysfunctional and toxic environment that that I was in. Mm-hmm. And you know, turned out turned out great. Spent a lot of time, you know, with with nonprofits trying to make a real difference in the world. That is great. What well, what would you say? Because and and don't be humble. Clearly, you are so gifted and so talented. I mean, somebody can if somebody is lucky enough, like I've been to spend five minutes in your presence and speak with you. It's like you you just want to just like listen, like just even me keep my mouth shut for two minutes. Out of all your attributes that you feel has made you successful, what, what would you say was the most important one? Um, I believe it's helping everyone, you know, create more value for the, for everyone in the whole world, like, like, you know, help everybody whenever you can. I mean, we all have limited, you know, capacity to do that, um, to, to create more value in the world. And when that happens, more things sort of expose themselves to me and, and, in opportunities, it could be investment opportunities that, you know, it could be new clients, it could be new friendships, et cetera. Um, I, I, I've always done that. It's just, it's just been in my bones, you know, seeing examples in the home where I, I didn't want to be that way. And I learned more from folks about what not to do than what to do. Cause you, you, you know, for me, I just really internalize that and, and try to do it better. But what I noticed in my um, larger, you know, business with 500 employees, it was such an incredible community every weekend. There's lots of things going on. People are um, um, helping each other when when tragedies would happen, they would all surround an employee and and support them. So this is incredible, and and so I've I've thought this for decades now. But um, if we can strengthen communities where they have each other's backs, especially in bad times, you need less and less support from government. And I think it's the answer to everything that's you know that's wrong right now. And and I wish our elected officials just like a strong community should be doing everything they can to create better conditions to work, live, learn, and play for every citizen here, not gain power, keep power, grow power, money, and all the things that are going on. Healthy communities just do it better. And so what I believe in the mind methodology, when you when you deploy this in an organization, um, when you start, it could be a really dysfunctional culture. After a year, everybody's having fun. It's just... It's so different. It strengthens the community. And so I was able to impact thousands in my different you know, companies. And I looked at the company as a community, their, the employees' families as a community, their circle of friends, other things that they engage with, our, our contractors, our customers, um, they can all feel it. So now my goal is to get it to tens of millions of people in terms of how the mind methodology touches them because it really strengthens the community. It teaches people how to create value faster. It elevates self-esteem. It's um, it, it, That's where I want to make a difference in the world. So my, my exits have been, I think I said it earlier, but from a few million dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and uh, it, I, I do this work because I love the work and it really keeps my brain um, you know, moving and I keep growing personally and professionally by doing it. I'll never stop as long as I can do this. This is so important. So if I may, it, there's so much I want to, sh- to comment on and thank you for all of that. But it just feels like, you know, when, when life gives you lemon, you make lemonade. It feels like you're doing for everybody, what you wished came easier for you, what was done for you, because, you know, healing yourself, 
be by healing others, being a servant leader. That's, that's how you describe yourself. And, you know, the community helping each other, you know, the word tribe and tribal has a negative connotation today, but that is in fact what a tribe does. You gather around, like nobody starves or everybody starves, you know, every enough, there's enough to go around. There's not hoarding. There's, there's a sense of, as I said earlier, the greater good, the commune, the community. Um, and it, and, and it's brilliant. And to be able to do that at, on a global level, good Lord, you know, Godspeed. I'm assuming I'm going to make a big assumption. I'm going to make a big assumption. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. That you're happy. When did you know you were happy? Because you couldn't have been happy in all those years in that toxic environment. You know, when, when people throw out happiness and um, use any word you want and, and easy and, and, and all of it, I think it has to be hard at the right interval for everyone to grow and to truly be happy from time to time. Cause you can't be happy a hundred percent of the time. If everything, if now we're back to what parents are trying to do for kids and then they don't, they don't de develop character. So I think, I think it's everything I went through. I'm thankful for everything. Like it, it made me who I am, how I look at the world, how I think about creating value, all of it. And I said it earlier, the, the scarcest commodity to me is not time. It's positive emotional energy. And you have to have lows to have higher and higher positive emotional energy that's real uh, it is the way I like to think about it. So what what's easy for me to deal with and handle today, um, you know, 20 years ago or 10 years ago was hard. And so I, I just love that growth path. And it can't be always easy and smooth and everybody's happy all the time. And, and again, you, you know this again better than than I with the work that you do. But I intentionally think about that stuff. I, I want to grow. I think I can change how I feel about things, but you have to work at it over time uh, to, to make it happen. And this is just part of how I'm, I'm looking at the mind methodology and working with teams and developing everybody to go down that road. I love starting with a client or a team anywhere and then reflecting back a year and how it's so different and and how they the conversations they have how they feel about things their self-esteem all of it it's incredible curiosity i believe well curiosity is is a is 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 a tool to increase emotional intelligence right people don't think about it they think about the four quadrants blah 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 but really if you're curious about somebody else's position or why somebody feels that way right you keep a connection you're not judging so how has that curiosity played a role in your business success because you're swimming with the sharks. You know, I've done work with GE, you know, IBM, and, you know, sometimes these aren't the nicest people in the room. So <laughs> how did curiosity play a role for you and or, and or something else that's not taught in school? Yeah. Um, what's not taught in school is to how to know the, how to know what game you're playing and what are the rules of the game. And so whether you're playing basketball or football or soccer, uh, no, I don't say soccer, uh, volleyball, the rules are all different. So you have to understand what is the game that you're playing? Who are you playing with? What are their strengths? What do you bring to the table? It's all those things because it's about you having the mindset of the team. So it's not just your individual contribution for yourself is for how do you play the game and help your team win? And then if you're lucky, you be, you get the MVP, right. And, and you get <laughs> promoted of that, but you have to know that there is a game and then there's a role that you play in that game. And so when you look at swimming with the sharks and you say, well, and I, I was always a copycatter. I was always like, you know, um, what does success look like? Success looks like that guy right there. He's always getting money. She's always getting money. She's always getting uh, a name in the paper, whatever success looked like. Then I want to understand what they did. Right. right. So, if And by the way, I, I, that's what I did too. And, and I feel for some reason, and this could be a sidebar, I feel that's lost today. Now, when we look at someone that's successful, it's like, woe is me. But they don't, they don't want to work hard. They don't want to put in the hours that we put in, but they want what we have. Oh, so yeah. for the listeners, I want everybody to hear, she saw success and mimicked that. 
she didn't begrudge it. Right. I don't know. Right. Feel that's that true. Like as, as a IBM employee, I mean, I remember I was told that I would only be a secretary and I had to go to secretarial school. So then I joined after I got my college degree and didn't listen to my counselor anymore. I went to IBM and I saw IBMers dressed in blue pinstripe suits. Blue, navy you know, blue, yeah. And 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 burgundy wingtip shoes. And so you don't only win by what you dress, but that's that's a good place to start. You know, what is the culture? Well, it means you belong here. You look, you look. Like you belong here, you know, people say, oh, you, sh- you know, how you dress shouldn't matter. I'm like, no, there's a reason why dress for success is a billion dollar industry. And if to your point earlier, if you want to play the game, you got to dress the part. Yeah. The NBA players, for those that don't know, they can't just show up at the stadium any kind of way. They have to dress in a suit or yeah. a designer attire as they're just walking into the to the locker room. And if they don't, they'll either be fined or they won't be able to play. So that's the rule of that game. So everybody's got to right. know the rules of, of what does it take to win. And and there's something called pie. They don't teach you this in college or in school in uh, in the business. And I'll be real quick. It's P I E. It's performance, image, and exposure. My mother always thought that just perform well, Daphne. They'll notice you. They'll promote you. You'll be mm-hmm. fine. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Performance doesn't work for women at all. At all. Performance is is good, but that's not all you need. You have to have the image and a brand that says, I'm collaborative. I, I'm eager to learn. I want to help you. I'm productive. I'm always early. I'm never late. What does your image say about you? Because when somebody knows that Patty Ann's coming to a meeting, they're either related or they're pissed off. Which one is it going to be for you? So make sure that you know your image is positive and is, is productive. And then E is exposure. Who knows you? And who do you know? Who will speak up for you when you're not in the room with them and you're not on Zoom? So if you know Spanish and you know engineering, you might be the one that your sponsor could say, you know what, Daphne speaks Spanish. She knows engineering. Let her go to Brazil for that expat assignment so she Mm -hmm. can set up that new manufacturing facility over there in Brazil. But if nobody knows you, you may have all the qualifications in the world but you will never be uh, promoted or acknowledged because nobody knows you. So pie, they never teach you that. So a couple of things. One is the purpose, right? I mean, Simon Sinek with what's your why? Like he, (laughs) you know, such a part of the vernacular, but I'm not so sure companies really live it, right? Like Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll have the mission, they'll have the the purpose, they'll have the core values. But, you Mm -hmm. know, the example that I always love to, to, to talk about is when, John, President John Kennedy was building, wanted to send a man to the moon, and he went down mm. to Houston to the Space Center, and there was a janitor. Yeah, was- I love this story. Yes. Right. Go ahead. You you tell it. You'll tell it better than me. Uh, I don't know. No, no. You were like going, uh, you're uh, riffing well. So oh, okay. Me- and and, yeah, and he went it. around. I love the story, and, though. And John Kennedy, of course, had the, you know, such charisma, right? Yeah. And he said to the janitor sweeping the floor, he said, something about like, what's your job or what are you doing here? And the man said, you know, I'm the janitor. And he said, but I am part of the team that's mm-hmm. putting a man on the moon. To yeah. me, that just encapsulates mm-hmm. everything about the value of a, of a per, the purpose. That higher and purpose. You yeah. bring that. The man was a janitor. He was sweeping yeah. the floor, but his yeah. per, it, it actually, every time I tell the story, it gives me goosebumps. It, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's really incredible. It is. Yeah. And it's, um, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go uh, ahead. So yeah. I, and I, and I have to say this because I've, you know, I love that story at the same time, it hasn't been verified that is actually true. <laughs> so it's oh the story, the story. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, how many stories are true <laughs> <laughs> or based on some truth, but I, I mean, I've uh, recounted that story as well because we actually see that in practice every day now. And I love the point of what you said, how many companies actually live according to not just their purpose statement or not just their mission, but their values. And I think that's also something that JFK was a huge part of why he was so successful in leading the country that when he did, is that he brought it back to our values, our personal values, and that sense of higher purpose. So I have a like greater a, than ourselves. Then greater than ourselves. And you know, ask not what you could do for, you know, 
as you know, that whole, is that right? That's not, That's what, not your, what you could do, do for you, do for you, what you can do, do for your country. country. Exactly. exactly. And he was able to inspire with that versus now, if that was said, I don't know how people would take that in. So I think that just in company. What about for companies? And that's, that's why that's I bring it back to companies. companies. Yes, and yeah. this is why I'm so like so passionate about this work because I think workplaces is when we ask ourselves like how can we create societal change for the better. I believe workplaces is a huge channel in which we can do that now. Like I've been in companies that basically because they live by their values, like. And, you know, incentivized, reward and recognized by them. Therefore, they're li- being lived, not just, you know, worthless words on the wall. They actually feel they're living their own values and living a better life, therefore, and living a le- better life for themselves and the people they love. So it's kind of like this almost backdoor, you know, like Trojan horse way of hmm. essentially living better lives because the values are real and instilled and lived by in companies. So I, I see it as, you know, one company at a time, one organization, one team at a time, when they live more meaningfully with alignment, with purpose and values, that in effect is how we're creating positive change in society and how we interact with ourselves and each other. Now, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to this movement, to, to getting companies to buy into you, what what you call the ROI, the uh, ripple on impact, which I love, absolutely love. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a, uh, I call it the double ROI. So there's the return on investment, the traditional one. And we've seen over the last 15 years for those places, those companies that double down on their people, they consistently outperform the S&P 500, even in you know, bad economic mm-hmm. times and something mm-hmm. that we're enduring now. So In that sense. So there's that that we know. So that's just in in the data. And then the other side of it is that ripple of impact. That's the double ROI. And the ripple of impact happens when we can actually instill these things so that every single person is showing up as authentic to themselves, living according to their purpose and values, all the things that we're talking about in scientific happiness, and uh, able to align that with the organization. If every person is showing up that way, that in effect, in effect is actually authentically living out the higher purpose of the company because people are li- living out their internal purpose within themselves, rippling that impact to the team and therefore that of the company and their customers and their partners and vendors in an authentic way, everyone that they touch in their ecosystem. So I think the beauty of what we have right now is that more and more leaders are seeing that profits can coexist, if not be bolstered by having purposeful, authentic leaders within the company. That level of coexistence, I don't think we've seen that much before, but those you know, leaders that are progressive enough to see that they are actually correlated directly between profits and the ability to grow through their people, uh, I think those are the ones that actually are ready and well-positioned uh, to endure. You know, We still have a lot of hardships that are coming. 